So I'd like to um, acknowledge country and pay our respects to the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people um, of the country that us in Canberra are coming from. And I'd like to pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. And also, um, I've got bad network quality, and also acknowledge any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that are with us today. Um, let's just hope that doesn't impact you're, on you're me. You're coming through clearly. Okay, me. thank you. Apologies for that, everyone. Um, so I'd really love to welcome Mark today. Um, Nature Look like Nell Trust is one of the, I suppose, one of the newer philanthropics on the on the block, although Mark tells me they've been around for 10 years now, which is amazing. Um, Mark has worked in the non-government sector in the 90, 1990s and then worked as an ecologist for the South Australian government until um, he moved out to set up Nature Glenelg Trust in 2011. They launched Nature Glenelg Trust in 2012 and Mark has led it ever since. He's got an honours degree in applied science a research background in small mammal ecology, and over the past 15 years, he's been developing his supplied professional skills in restoration science, including wetland restoration science, which we're talking about today. Um, Mark, as you will see through his presentation, is extremely passionate about the problems that we're facing around legacy issues around geography and about how we communicate science in a positive and accessible way. Now, the beauty about Mark's presentation today is it fits beautifully with our theme of the 50th anniversary of Ramsar, and I think it actually paints um, a very positive and optimistic picture about where we can head with our wetlands in Australia. He'll be focusing on um, sites in South Australia, Victoria and Tasmania, and um, we've all been wanting to have a look at what's been going on there. So welcome, Mark. And please post any questions for Mark in the chat and we'll have a little discussion once the prezo is finished. Thanks, Mark. Fantastic. Thanks very much for the introduction, Cathy. And I'll just check that you can see my screen before you check out. Assuming so. Yes, we can. Thanks, Mark. Fantastic. Uh, it's a real, yeah, it's a real pleasure and privilege to have been invited to speak with you all today and uh, yeah, it's an interesting time to be talking to you because it's at a period of some reflection, I suppose. NGT is coming up to 10 years since we launched in January. And so it's there's been a, a couple of things I've done lately that have caused me to, to think back and reflect. And the request to talk about projects that uh, that both Nature Glenelg Trust and also going back a little bit, uh, some of us who are involved at NGT were involved in prior to starting NGT uh, in terms of Ramsar sites in this part of the world and wetland restoration is... It's quite timely, I think. Uh, so, yeah, we'll. Um, the the downside of trying to cover a lot of ground today is that uh, each one of these sites could probably have their own full talk. So we won't go into the level of detail that uh, I would like to, or that you would probably like to hear. But hopefully, in in zooming around, it'll give you a bit of a sense of some of the things that have been happening and that could happen, and the opportunities that exist for for really uh, thinking about having a closer look at. At, at wetlands in this part of the world and what we might do to improve their ecological values going forward. The timing today is perfect to be talking to you because not only is it 50 years this year of the Ramsar Convention and what that's meant for putting a, a spotlight on wetland issues internationally, it's we also happen to be in year one of the, the decade of uh, ecosystem restoration, which is an internationally uh, really apt, I think, at the moment, considering especially discussions going on at the moment with uh, international conventions happening to talk about what we do with uh, with with carbon emissions and climate change. Well, ecosystem restoration is front and centre of that discussion, in my view, and, and wetlands have this really interesting angle that uh, they are, in, in many cases, carbon-rich environments themselves. So, Really great to be able to pull these two themes together in talking to you about a few of the sites we're going to look at today. So let's dive in. Uh, in terms of where we're going to be looking today in southeastern Australia, uh, sites that have had past hydrological uh, changes made that are having ecological impacts. There's a couple of sites that we've been working at over the last few years that uh, I'll mention first. And so you'll see down there on the east coast of Tassie, 
Malting Lagoon and Apsley Marshes Ramsar sites side by side near Swansea uh, and near Freycinet National Park for, for those of you that have travelled down that way. Uh, site number 18 there, Port Phillip Bay. Uh, there's a, a portion of that site that we've looked at in the last couple of years and we'll talk about that. And I will just mention uh, before I talk about the next couple of sites, those these are long-term Ramsar sites. You know, these are some of the in a tranche of sites that was announced back in the nine, early 1980s when, when the states were proclaiming areas under the convention. You know, these are very early sites, those first two, but they still have these legacy issues that that uh, predate their, their, um, their declaration as Ramsar areas. Interestingly, um, a couple of the most recent sites that have Ramsar status are a couple that uh, we've been involved in over the years and, and we'll also touch on and interestingly these were subject to restoration activities and works at the very time of their designation which makes them a little different to the first two we'll talk about. So just to kick off we'll go down to Tassie first and, and there's a map of the the two Ramsar sites, Apsley Mar Marshes to the north and, and the much larger Molten Lagoon uh, site to the south of it. The, this map is just to give you an idea of just how early the drainage impacts uh, that we've inherited in the landscape often occurred. And particularly in the parts of southeastern Australia that were settled really early on, it's not it's not uncommon to come across these these legacy issues. And, and we can't actively uh, date the the timing of these works down to the precise year because we don't have the uh, technology that goes back far enough. You know, we do know that by the time of the first aerial photography that we have in 1948 that uh, that those drains were in existence and we're piecing together the history of the, the why and when, uh, which is proving to be an interesting exercise uh, in itself. In terms of uh, I think the person who's just joined us may not be on mute, so if they could do that, please, that would be great. Thanks. I'm getting some background noise. In terms of uh, what we're doing through the assessment work that's happening at the moment, because this is a project that's currently underway, as we work our way around the site looking at different areas that are, uh, are the subject of the work, we're being able to piece together more of the story. So to, to zoom in on this part of the site called Long Point, which straddles uh, a property uh, owned by the Tasmanian Land Conservancy. You can see there that subsequent drainage works continued to occur and we're able to much more accurately date the timing of those and thankfully these are in the living memory of people who can tell us a bit about the why and, and wherefores of what, you know, what this was about. So Long Point is a really interesting site and when you look at what those lines on a map actually look like on the ground, they're quite apparent you know these are these were even though these particular uh, banks and drains were constructed in the 1800s uh, you know quite a substantial amount of work was done probably convict labor involved and trying to piece together the the reason for these works is quite interesting it's also interesting to see there when you look along these banks you just get a sense of the interaction between hydrology and ecology and I'll ask you to think of this both in terms of the footprint of those works so where the the, the channel there is and the bank. You can see there are changes in vegetation that have occurred as a result of those works. But then also looking at the wider landscape, the reason that these works were done was to influence the hydrology over often a much larger area. And so we were able to piece together that at this site, we weren't really just talking about, uh, in fact, these weren't just drains. The the, the banks were the main thing that, that uh, the the, the landowner in the 1800s was putting in place to try and prevent the ingress of of uh, uh, flows from the surrounding estuary and and to facilitate improved production off that ground, remembering that at that time the country was being used pastorally. So they were deliberately trying to cause a shift in vegetation growing in that in that area, drying it out, making it more productive for grazing. Now over subsequent decades and, and flood events, parts of this levee system have been breached, but it is still having an impact on hydrology at the site, as well as creating this impact, the quite uh, specific impact in the location of the works themselves. To the south, you'll also see the more recent drainage works were done uh, as part of a failed aquaculture enterprise. And uh, again, quite a narrow footprint, but having a wider impact on the way that water is flowing between the, the Ramsar 
listed wetlands surrounding this site and some of the wetlands within the property itself. So this is just an example. It's a much bigger site. We're working our way around more of the site, but as one of the first sites that we've been looking at that has investment to come in, rest in restoration works. In terms of what those works can look like, I'll just give you an example of how a method we've used elsewhere will probably be the method that we look at adopting here. And we're going through the process at the moment of finalising plans for, for this work, which will hopefully happen next year. Uh, this is a site also a nationally significant site actually. This is a, a place called Stipaturus Conservation Park. Uh, the wetland there is called Glenshira Swamp and it is uh, part of the nationally listed Flurio Swamps wetland ecological community. At this site there's a diversion drain that we're showing here. You can see the again the change in vegetation where you have the spoil bank that's been constructed next to it and literally the restoration uh, works at this location at this part of the site involves sweeping the, the spoil back into the drain and if you're lucky you've got a, a soil type that isn't deteriorating or degrading sometimes peat uh, disappears because of its nature it's um, it oxidizes and you don't necessarily end up with as much material as you need but at this site we were fortunate that the uh, it was a sandy material and there was enough there to backfill the drain completely and then you have the next flow event and 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 once you do that, then begins this natural recovery process, which is triggered as a result of reinstating hydrology, resaturating sediments, reinstating flow paths. Another part of that same site where we backfilled a drain, uh, that's slightly less disturbed than that first area, which had been sown to pasture and, and used for farming. This, this next area, thankfully, continued to retain native vegetation. One of the interesting things that happens when you sweep back a spoil bank and, and even though you have a short-term disturbance footprint, as you'll see there, uh, what ends up happening is that you trigger this spontaneous recovery in the native seed seed bank that continues to persist in, in that area. And what's important about that recovery is that you favour the right species because having put the spoil back in the drain, and in this case, yep. this is a part of the system that's a peat oh, wetland. Uh, I'm not sure if that's you, Catherine, or somebody else, but we're getting background chatter again on the line. Um, if people could please make sure they're muted, that would be great, thanks. Um, so yeah, what, what happens when we sweep that 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 peat back into the, the drain and knit the surface back together is we've basically resaturated that, that peat profile. It's preventing that ease of um, removal of water from the system, which is why the drain was dug in the first place. And that resaturation then favours the species that we want to do the best after we've done the restoration works. And so uh, that's that that's the process that you're seeing there basically unfolding is the right species responding after work. So rather than the drying out of a system, we're actually favouring the wetland species that um, that we want to take hold and be the, the building blocks of the recovery that follows. And so if you think about the, the link to the site down there, in, in Tassie at, at Long Point, we're hoping and expecting that we'll see a very similar process unfold. So favouring the right species in that disturbance footprint and also facilitating the movement of flows across a wider area of salt marsh, which again is a nationally threatened ecological community in its own right, rather than having this, this legacy issue of 150 years ago, um, continuing to persist in a protected area that's of high value. So that's the logic of, of what we're looking at at that site. Just really quickly, another part of uh, the area, the neighbouring Apsley Marshes Ramsar site. This is a this is a doozy. This site, in terms of complexity, um, we've been able to sort of ascertain the configuration of drains out there and what they appear to have been constructed for. But we're still nutting out the exact mechanics of how they're interacting with the site, and particularly as these drains were constructed again back in the 1800s with the the idea of dewatering this peatland but also facilitating the flows that come, come into this system from the catchments upstream and trying to shunt it straight through, preventing it from inundating the site. Now, as we've heard from the landowner there and as we're discovering ourselves, uh, those dra these drainage works were not entirely effective for their intended purpose. Um, every time there's a heavy downpour, which uh, this year there continues to be, it seems. Uh, this is images back from May when there was a big flood event showing just how 
uh, much water can back up in the system as a result of inflows. Uh, it also dries down reasonably quickly, but what we're finding at this site and what the landowner is telling us is that those drains are actually facilitating the ingress of salt water from Moulton Lagoon further and further into the marshes, which are meant to be a freshwater uh, environment. So that interface between salt and fresh is moving upstream. It's affecting the nature of the country. This is a, a multi-use Ramsar site. It is still grazed, uh, you know, consistent with the convention and its intentions to be at times covering areas of multiple use. Uh, and you know, there's a re range of reasons here that are driving this drainage itself, the the uh, collapse of the peat, which happens when you drain peat, it it subsides, uh, it 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 oxidises over time. This is contributing to obviously uh, carbon emissions. Plus, we've got the the dual effect of rising sea levels and the impact that that's having uh, on uh, on the downstream environment and how far saline flows can push back in. So, lots to tease apart here. We don't yet have the plan of attack formulated, but uh, because this is a work in project, uh, in progress, this project, but a fascinating site, and we're really, uh, you know, enjoying getting to know about this system and and all of its quirks and its complexities, of which there's a lot. So let's zoom across onto the the mainland now and around the western side of Port Phillip Bay. Uh, we were invited by the uh, the local CMA in this area to uh, have a closer look and try and understand what was going on at this site. The main concern was the impact of this road that you can see on an area of salt marsh to the to the right or to the west in the image. Uh, this is at a place called the Spit Nature Conservation Reserve, which is embedded within the wider Ramsar site. The specific place is called Big Marsh. And it's a really interesting place because you've got this, these very gentle gradients and a zone where the salt marsh transitions from an area that is really regularly interacting with tides to areas that are considered more at the drier end of the salt marsh um, uh, tolerance range. The question was, what impact was this road having on exacerbating the impacts um, uh, you know, th that, that were being observed on the health of the salt marsh in the right of that image? And when we went back and did the historic analysis, it was interesting to see that where the road is today, there, it looks like some works have been done a long time ago to actually facilitate access to areas to the south through this area, possibly uh, uh, reducing the ability for flows to interact either side of that line, even before there was an official road that was a track there. So this image is from the 1940s. When you fast forward to today, and this is just one example of the sort of technology that we use, LIDAR is a particularly useful tool. Um, depending on vegetation type, it can be extremely useful. Sometimes vegetation density can affect its uh, our capacity to use it to the finest degree that we would like. But at this site, reasonably good bare ground to be able to get a sense of levels. You can see the impact of building up the, the levee bank for the road effectively through the middle of this, the causeway for the road through the middle of this site. Uh, interestingly, one of the things that, that we were able to observe with the road, and this is an action that's already been implemented at this site, was adjusting the way that it had been left since an upgrade to the culverts under the road were put in in the, the 90s. And so we've removed all those stop logs after doing monitoring before and after, and we've seen that that is having a positive effect on exchange under the road. But that was only the tip of the iceberg. And this, is, this site is really quite interesting. For such a small site, there was a lot going on. And so, you know, this is the, the, the this is a complicated site because it's on the edge of the Werribee treatment plant and, and some of the lagoons there you can see are associated with the Werribee plant, which as you'll be aware is part of that Ramsar site. So that's the road location where we were seeing this restriction in tidal flows and flows generally under the road. But we also discovered that in the process of the treatment plant setting up its lagoons next door and, and also its uh, its irrigation paddocks, they had modified the way that an inflowing creek was interacting with the salt marsh, uh, diverting the flows uh, around and and out and, and away from the salt marsh. So that was another issue we identified. The seepage itself from those lagoons, which are valuable wildlife habitat and are managed as such in their own right, but by elevating the water levels in there with fresh water, we were noticing that there is a, an effect of seepage to the south and detrimental effects on the species composition in that in that salt marsh area as a result of that surcharging with with fresher water 
Uh, issues of grazing still impacting on the site and the quality of fencing and, and a discussion with the neighbours was also uh, an important topic to explore and we had very positive response from the neighbours there and uh, and works are likely to follow on that regard. And finally, last but not least, sea level rise. Now, I won't go into all of these, but one quick example I'll give you of a, of a potential pathway forward here that went into the restoration plan that we've drafted for this site is the idea of reinstating and slowing down the flows from the Avalon Creek. It's, a, it's just a flashy ephemeral system that when you get a heavy dump of rain, it'll, it'll trickle a flow in or, uh, or sometimes slightly more, depending on how much rain we get. Uh, the, because the site has been modified, um, you know, but the idea of having a potential restoration area in stream that cleans that water up and slows it down and allows it then to eventually spill and fill and flow back through the salt marsh, remembering that where the, the constant saturation and inflows of fresh water from those lagoons as a potential negative, dry salt marsh areas need need pulses of fresh flow to maintain their health. It's the underlying uh, and permanent sort of saturation that was the issue with the lagoon. So seeing these temporary fresh, fresh, fresh pulses reinstated through the site is something that we feel is quite important to reinvigorating its health. Um, lots of discussion still here to go. This is a complicated issue straddling three different landowners, um, but we're hopeful of a positive outcome uh, with some of these other issues beyond the, the obvious uh, issues with the road. Final comment about sea level rise. Uh, oh, sorry, I'll just, before I go into sea level rise, I will just also mention that it's really interesting when you're thinking about these issues to actually piece together the when and the how they came about. And with this site, these issues, when you actually map out when they came about and how they've occurred, it, it does start to help you understand how and why these wetland sites and and I'd hate to break it to you, but across southeastern Australia, almost every wetland site you could make a table up like this because there are very few sites that are that are genuinely pristine or untouched. Most of our reserve sites have a history of or a legacy of changes that were made when areas were being used either pastorally or or you know in a in a previous private use phase. So this site had a lot. And when you actually piece them together, you realize, yeah, gee, this is a complicated story to disentangle. You know, so understanding this trajectory of change through time with wetlands is just critical to us being able to make informed decisions about management. I can't emphasise that strongly enough. In terms of going forward, this is complicated and this is an issue that's going to affect our entire coastline, really thinking ahead about what we expect to see with sea level rise. So the changes that we're thinking about making here, there's also a view needs to be put forward to the future about thinking about how this site can interact with the predicted changes we're going to see. And these, without going into the detail, just a quick, a quick show of where we are roughly now, where we're likely to be at 20 centimetres and potentially by the end of the century, you know, where where tidal ingress and occasional king tides may influence, you can see that where, um, you know, the story of coastal wetlands is a story of change and we have to get our heads around that. You know, if we're thinking not just from a planning point of view, but just an environmental management point of view. Uh, this is this is the future that we've got coming. So we need to be aware of it and really think through, think these things through in the decisions we're making today. Rightio, so let's, let's go west uh, across to uh, the near border zone, uh, just south of where I'm based, uh, in this border zone between South Australia and Victoria. Uh, we'll start with Piccaninny Ponds, which is a place that's dear to my heart. Uh, this is the earliest map I've been able to find of the Piccaninny Ponds wetland system, which as you'll see, historically straddled the border and all of the spring discharge from Piccaninny Ponds actually used to flow into the Glenelg estuary at its mouth, which would have been a fascinating thing to, to witness. When these flows were interrupted, there were a lot of locals that were very unhappy about the changes that they observed in the fishing in the river. That's a story for another day, uh, because there's, there's a full hour seminar just on this site. But if we fast forward to around the time, and there was uh, my supervisor at the time uh, in the South Australian government, uh, Brenton Greer, uh, was liaising with people in Canberra about uh, a Ramsar, you know, uh, Ramsar listing this area back in the early 2000s. Uh, that process ended up taking a long time. The requirements for nomination changed. In the background, a whole lot of things were happening. It ended up being quite useful that the delay occurred for reasons I'll explain in a moment. 
But around the time that that discussion was happening and that there was an interest in seeing a, a cast spring-fed wetland system actually listed under the uh, under the convention in Australia, uh, this is the status of the wetland system uh, on the South Australian side of the border. Basically, it was a system that even in the reserved portion, which is where that number three outlet drains from, uh, which is an which is is park and, and was park at the time, uh, a highly modified system from a hydrological point of view. Notwithstanding the fact that there are still fantastic environmental values there in that modified state, but to be clear, it was a highly modified system despite the fact that those values were persisting. So, this was around the time that I was getting interested in wetland restoration. We managed to get some funding for a wetland restoration project, uh, interestingly uh, run by a, a, a member of NGT's team now actually, uh, Ben Taylor. So the first stage that we looked at was stopping the rot effectively in Piccaninny Ponds itself and lifting the, the levels at that artificial outlet to prevent it drawing down on the levels in the main spring fed pools there. So this is the first structure and fishway that was built. And if you have a look at the effect upstream, it was it was significant and immediate, but it didn't affect a very large area. This was it was a first step down a longer path. Around the same time, I was uh, very active working with people throughout the department to see if we could expand the area that was reserved to allow us to think about the bigger picture for hydrology in this area. And a uh, very long story, but somehow we managed to get there and these two areas were added to the reserve. It was a very difficult process, but a lot of fantastic people you know, working together to, to achieve this outcome in the government at the time. The, the most significant one of these is the Pick Swamp Purchase to the West, which really allowed us to think about restoration of a property scale area of, of cast spring fed wetland. Those initial restoration works um, were blocking and backfilling drains in strategic locations across the property. And this is the process that started to unfold. Uh, basically, the spring water couldn't escape anymore and it just started filling from the ground up effectively. It was a fascinating thing to watch. Uh, not something that we get to do every day. Well, we've done it a few more since, but uh, not in this sort of landscape context. It's, it's a fascinating thing to watch in a spring fed site. Down at the, um, the western end, there is another property outside of the area that was being restored and we couldn't achieve full restoration without doing additional works to prevent uh, inundation of the neighbouring property. And so uh, in 2008-9, we managed to get further federal investment uh, to continue works and allow for this area to really become what it's now become. And this is an example of the sort of works that were done at the time to, to build a levee bank along the western side, uh, make sure that we had a, a, a regulated flow path and also an emergency spillway because if you have a big rainfall event, you don't want the levee bank breaching. You'd rather it go down a, your emergency spillway to protect the uh, to protect the levee. Not ideal to build a levee bank through a wetland, but compromises need to be made sometimes to uh, to achieve the outcome that we're seeking. What did that look like from the air? Well, in 2003, this is the property prior to its purchase um, and showing it in its drain state. Thankfully, we did have remnant values with an area that was never managed to be drained up in the top corner there, uh, where there's a fantastic spring fed pool as well. And this is what it looked like after the, the water was returned to the site and held, and it's been wet ever since, basically, since 2007, when those works began at scale. And the recovery process has been unfolding ever since. In terms of what that looks like from standing on the dunes, uh, apologies for this being a bit pixelated, but you'll see this is just before the stock came off. There's still cows out there grazing in May 2007. This is what where the water level initially sat in a partially restored state and then after the levee bank was built and everything was able to settle in and the natural habitat recovery began to unfold. This is uh, this is the view uh, only five years later and it's noteworthy in looking at this view to consider that all the while that process I'd mentioned earlier about the Ramsar nomination was had well and truly gained its momentum and gathered steam. And because this work had unfolded, we were really fortunate that the original vision of Piccaninny Ponds Conservation Park as it originally stood being listed was actually able to be expanded to encompass this newly restored wetland. And so the Ramsar nominated site boundary is there and this got up in 2012. Uh, 
you know, for a lot of us who are involved over a long period of time, it was a really proud moment to see all of these threads come together. And, and you know, I'm really wrapped to be able to, to you know, this is a it's, a, it's a protection story, but it's also having the restoration uh, aspect to this really front and centre in a, you know, such recent works in a, in a Ramsar listed site, I think is a really good uh, reminder of what's possible if we if we put our minds to it and if we select sites carefully for restoration works. It's a big pat on the back for wetland restoration effectively. So that wasn't the end of the story and I guess this is the moral of the story today is that just because a site has Ramsar designation, is in a protected area, doesn't mean that there aren't potentially further works to do to correct those long-term uh, legacy issues that are affecting hydrology. We were aware that the works at the main outlet at Piccadilly Ponds was not the, the end of the story and thankfully, again, thanks to federal investment, this was one of the last grant applications I think I was involved in before I left the department, was writing the project proposal uh, with Steve Clark, great bloke who is no longer with us unfortunately, but was very heavily involved in running the restoration projects down there. Um, managed to get investment to do additional works in Piccadilly Ponds to really kick it along to the next stage. So lifted levels further, that required an upgrade, uh, upgrade of the fishway and the, uh, and the weir on the artificial outlet, which also then along with some other on ground works allowed the reconnection of flows between the main ponds there that you can see and the eastern wetlands, which post drainage in the early 1900s had filled in with drifting sand and so, yes, we're in a protected area here, a Ramsar site, but the excavators went out there and very carefully recreated uh, the flow path, which allows for that connectivity. Critical for native freshwater fish. We've got a number of diadromous species in the system and other values. So uh, that now, to go out there now, it's, it's, it's basically naturalised. You wouldn't know that the works were done um, in this way and for that purpose and and wetlands are very quick to bounce back and and to recover so again another take-home message from today in terms of a quick summary of what that has looked like it means that that view that i showed you earlier of a modified system just in 2003 is now absolutely on a different trajectory going forward and the sort of values that we're seeing recover nationally significant values threatened species a newly listed threatened ecological community, you know, fantastic result in a short space of time. Uh, and yes, I just mentioned the listing that this only went through last year, the, the spring fed community that is within Piccadilly Ponds and occurs across this uh, very, a very tight geographic area uh, of far southeast and South Australia and southwest Victoria uh, is what occurs in this site. And along looking along the levee bank, you know, this is this is a community, unlike a lot of others that are nationally listed, that we can actually recover, uh, which is remarkable considering how threatened it is and how little of it is left. You can see there, looking along the levee bank, back when the work was first done and now today, that's effectively a before and after image looking either side of that bank. And it is possible to restore and recover these wetlands uh, by regulating artificial drainage and the environmental values will follow. We also lock up a lot of carbon because these peat wetland systems are extremely, uh, th th they occur on uh, a peat sediment rather than a mineral soil. So, you you know, these are, these are, this is a soil type that is majority carbon in content. It's made up of the plant material from these wetlands that have been collapsing in the water over time. Uh, so yes, it's a, in terms of hitting a few different key themes for the moment, uh, these particular types of wetlands you know, carbon benefit, uh, stressed aquifer, water benefits, and also the environmental values that follow. So it's, to me, this is a message of hope that not all of the, uh, yeah, not all of the listings under the EPBC Act have to be about stopping bad things happening, even though that's a really important part of what legislation's for. What I'd like people to think about after hearing this story today is how can we use the listing and the legislation to actually be the promoter of making positive things happen, dangling carrots in the right places, creating the right incentives, because here's an ecological community with a whole lot of threatened species in it that will respond to restoration. So let's just jump across the border, literally just across the border to the to the corresponding wetland system on the other side of the Glenelg River. 
and uh, Long Swamp, which is part of the uh, Glenelg Estuary and Discovery Bay Ramsar site. This is uh, deliberately deliberately showing you a beautiful image here of, of what looks like really nice wetland habitat. But is it wetland habitat that's in its ideal state or is it changing? What do you think? Um, clearly, because I'm showing it to you, it's probably, uh, there's probably more to this story and more, to, more than meets the eye. So this will make sense in a moment. We had been told by locals uh, and you know, when NGT started, after the success of those of us that were involved with the Piccaninny Pond story uh, and with locals who were aware that um, uh, that Long Swamp had similar issues, you know, this was one of the first projects that the community really raised with us to look into. And when uh, when we went and had a closer analysis of, of looking at the aerial photo photographic record, we could see that the trend of change that the locals were telling us about, a drying out, a shrubbing up of the wetland system, was real this wasn't just something they were imagining so when we looked at what was going on with the habitat in 1950 based on the earliest aerial photography you can see here if you look closely at the blue and the red that's the aquatic and semi-aquatic habitats if we fast forward to when we did the analysis in 2013 you can see the shrubbing up of this area of the wetland system near a drainage outlet at nobles rocks was this was a genuine phenomenon this was something that was actually happening and and that comes at a cost of a suite of species that rely on those values and also downstream habitats that rely on flows. So th this is a long talk for another day, but to go straight to the, uh, I guess, straight to the, the pointy end of the story, um, we, we did a, a number of investigative pieces of work and ultimately decided that a restoration trial was a good idea rather than leaping straight into permanent works. Um, and that was because of the sensitivity of this environment. Uh, it's, it's culturally sensitive. It's also a really important area for biodiversity values. The idea being that we would start small and grow from there. So we began with a couple of different phases of trial structures, low level trial structures to allow us to understand how flows were working at the site in 2014. That was followed up by the big one in 2015, uh, which was a big effort by a lot of community volunteers and helpers and really allowed us to, to test out what would be possible if we uh, restricted flows completely out of the outlet of Nobles Rocks. And you'll see the vegetation change starting to unfold on the upstream side there if you look carefully with the, with the death of some of those invading shrubs. Now, in 2015, with that structure in place, we, we witnessed what was going on further inland at the places where the, the yeah, I guess the uh, accumulated effects of these changes started to unfold. And it, this image, as you'll see, where we have a gauge board, is very similar to that first snapshot that uh, that I showed you of the habitat. Now, look at what happens really quickly after lifting water levels by a modest amount, really, you know, a, a foot or so. So with water levels rising, it's 15, 14 centimetres at that location. This is exactly the same spot a few months later. And you can see water levels have risen and, and you can see the, the the health of the shrubs and what's going on here. The vegetation saying, right, maybe I'm not growing in the right place anymore. Fast forward a couple of years and we've had a wholesale change in in the habitat type effectively as a result of, of the plants moving and, and going back to the to the to the spot in the elevation gradient where where they should be. Now this is a really, it's an interesting concept to wrap your mind around. You can take, this is different to Pick Swamp. This was a reserved area, long-term reserved. The modifications were made 80 plus years ago. Um, everything looks natural. The native, It's all native species moving up and down slope, but it doesn't mean that the trajectory we're on is necessarily the one we want to be on. And this is where this change is really, you know, it's a significant image to be able to show you is just how quickly that change, we can revert a system back to the sort of trajectory that we want to see it on. Uh, all the while that, that this work was going on, a bit similar to, pick, to picking any ponds, uh, the local CMA were uh, had received uh, funding from the state and, and very high level support from within government to actually see this as uh, Victoria's next Ramsar site. And you'll see there that the, the listing ended up being a combination of the Discovery Bay wetland system and also the lower Glenelg National Park and the, the estuarine section of the river. A fantastic outcome and again we're really proud to be able to inject the information we were learning into that process and 
again, to have a situation where a listing was getting up at the same time as restoration being part of the story, to me, that's a really positive uh, positive part of this whole exercise, really. And it wasn't the end of the story. So that was what it looked like for a few years uh, after we monitored, measured, uh, could demonstrate the positive outcomes as a result of this work, we uh, received state government grant to to, to basically go the, the, the whole way through. And in 2019, we were able to uh, reinstate a sand dune over and around the trial structure. Uh, we set up a dredge on the beach and pumped it in and shaped the dune and it, it it's worked a treat. Um, it's yes there's some seepage that just trickles through and we've got a couple of pools in the former section of channel downstream but they don't breach the beach and um, i'll show you an image of what that's meant in a moment if we fast forward with replanting and subsequent uh, management investment in this site we are getting to a point now where our ultimate objective with our wetland restoration works wherever possible is to be able to walk away and come back to a site years, decades down the track and have people ask, where was the drain? Where were your works? You know, getting away from built infrastructure and concrete and things that need management and that go on an asset register. Parks Victoria were wrapped with this outcome because this isn't something that they need to go and maintain or needs further investment. We get this to settle in and bed down and it will blend into the landscape and the site looks after itself. So the trial phase was really important for giving people the confidence to go to this type of solution rather than doing what has become more typical, you know, highly engineered sites, gates and weirs that need management, the constant risk of them being sabotaged or people tinkering when they shouldn't. You know, this site now is set and forget. It looks after itself. And to me, that's really consistent with the status of the land and very consistent also with the aspirations of the traditional owners who have consulted with in this area as well. What that's looked like from above, just really quickly, you'll see uh, on the, the top left there, when we had the trial structure in place, but still had some flows um, going over the top of it, um, look at the amount of erosion around the outlet on the beach and compare that to this image, which I took last weekend, and you'll see the amount of accumulation of sand, even though we've got still some pools on the downstream side from seepage, which we expect, it's a sandy environment. This is what we expect to happen. We actually have new four dunes forming and there hasn't been a breach of the beach there now for a couple of years. And you'll see the plants, you know, there's there's another self-sustaining recovery process going on here in the vegetation on the beach there, which is going to add another layer of protection to the wetland at this site. Nature is a fantastic tool and enabler if we work with it. So this is another example of that. And so a summary quickly of this site, uh, in terms of looking at the length of Long Swamp, which as you can gather from the name, is a long system bounded by the dunes to the south from uh, Lake Momboang upstream through to Nobles Rocks. There's been little to no influence. These are elevated above the height of the trial structure. At the, the location of the trial itself and now the permanently restored outlet, uh, we've had a major influence and restored a, a, a wetland habitat type that in the system was declining. And this has been really positive for nationally threatened freshwater fish, frogs, uh, and, and another species I'll mention in a moment, which is quite topical, uh, not to mention a whole range of other values. And importantly, the downstream effect has been we've reinstated flows in a 10 or 11 kilometre stretch of valuable, vital wetlands that were being starved of those flows and reinstating flows back through the estuary and the natural pathway out through the Glenelgra mouth. So more subtle in terms of what you see with vegetation, but an absolutely measurable and real impact on, on a whole range of biodiversity values, which are continuing to play out as, you know, it was 80, 80 years plus that this um, interruption to those flows had occurred. So a, a quick story to finish. Uh, people may recall, uh, you know, with the long, long swamp site at least, um, People may recall that there was new information coming online back in 2015. A great guy called Matt Herring, who's doing work on the Australasian bittern, another nationally threatened species, put some uh, trackers on a small number of juvenile birds that they caught in the Riverina of New South Wales. And the very first one they put on was this bloke called Robbie the bittern, who you can see there with his, his transmitter on his back. Now, in terms of being, he's probably been our most uh, successful ambassador for wetland restoration. And in this case, Ramsar Wetlands, because the first place Robbie flew to when he left uh, the Riverina after hanging out there for a few weeks was Pick Swamp, 
which happens to be a hotspot now for Australasian bitterns. In fact, it's probably one of the most reliable places to see a bittern in the southeast of South Australia since it's been restored. Because of that, I suspect he got kicked out and it was only a, you know, a short time later, he made his way along and you can see he spent a bit of time at the estuary at Nelson. And then a few days later, he chugged his way along and literally within weeks of us having put the trial structure in place in 2015, this bitten with a transmitter on his back all the way from New South Wales decided he was going to stay at the newly restored wetland in Long Swamp at Nobles Rocks. So in terms of, um, yeah, in terms of a pat on the back for this this project, it was a fantastic, uh, you know, you couldn't have, talk about luck, I mean, of all the directions this bird could have flown and subsequent birds that Matt had transmitters on went to other parts of the Australian coastline, somehow we got lucky that the very first one decided to fly down this way and basically came and gave a big tick of approval to this restoration project in, in Long Swamp. And in fact, we spotted him down there uh, and in a couple of places along the coast at different times and if you look closer, you'll see that uh, transmitter absolutely visible. So we know it was him, <laughs> as well as getting the, the satellite readings. So yeah, really nice story. Um, in terms of just a, a quick thank you before I say a couple of closing things, these projects that I've reflected on today uh, would not have happened if it were not for the, uh, the previous and in some cases ongoing involvement and commitment of all these different organisations that are listed here. There's too many to name, but, you know, work in this restoration space does not, it generally, generally doesn't happen alone. You know, we have to be working with partners and looking for ways to try and uh, capitalise on each other's strengths. And the good news is there has been a lot of uh, community groups, agencies, state and federal that are really interested in backing this sort of work. And I can, I can only say how grateful we are for that over the years, because what you've seen today is a result of that collective effort and investment. Just a couple of closing thoughts. Um, I guess a bit of a personal touch to this story for me is just to reflect on the fact that Pick Swamp, it was a five year project for me in my old job, working for the state government of South Australia. and. I, I reflect on it as the place really where my passion for wetland restoration did begin and rather than seeing that as a standalone thing, it, it's no accident what we've gone on to do at NGT. This is really the, the place that I can trace where my enthusiasm to want to replicate this outcome across the landscape came from, just seeing how, how this site responded and um, yeah, that was the day we watched the spring you could literally follow the edge of the water that day as it was filling the paddocks for the first time. That's my eldest two sons uh, that were out with me that day in 2007. But um, it's okay to care about this stuff, you know, like it's okay to be passionate. And, and I, I would encourage you to all, you know, if you felt that waning, get out and, and, you know, rediscover it because we can all make this difference. And I'm, I'm really pleased that NGT has been able to carry that legacy on for the last 10 years. Um, over the last 10 years, we've now restored over 50 wetlands across all land tenures, predominantly in Victoria and South Australia, but hopefully soon down in Tassie with the project we're working on there with some fantastic partners as well. Um, this is one of the more high profile ones that if you wanted to, to look it up, there's some really neat things that were uh, put on the ABC and BBC websites uh, and is on our website from earlier this year at Walker Swamp. But uh, this is one of the few examples where we've had to step in and, and negotiate a, a solution that involves a change of land tenure where we've come in and owned the land. We, it's not our preferred scenario, but in some situations it's been really the only pathway. Uh, and if people are interested to have a look at this site when travel arrangements and borders allow, we're very happy to, you know, if you want to get in touch, it's a place that is publicly accessible if you make contact with us and we can give you the uh, details for how you can get there and have a look around. It's just near Dunkeld in the, the Southern Grampians in Western Victoria. Just a, yeah, I guess a, a couple of closing thoughts. Uh, this, this whole theme of what we've been talking about today, if it hasn't come through strongly enough already, you know, I guess my closing remark is just to reflect on our own biases and uh, and, and really where we've come from in being conservation trained people. And it, ultimately at times, my feeling is that this has led us to at times being a little bit too conservative. And 
If it hasn't come across strongly enough in the talk, I'll reiterate it now. We do need to intervene at sites at times to get things right and to make improvements, uh, particularly with wetlands, if we take the time to understand their history. And the good news is that gen generally really good things will happen if we make those those changes in a careful, considered way, understand the history. Uh, and there's a lot more of this out there to do, I guess, is the reason for making this point. Um, and yeah, as you'll see there in the image below, Pick Swamp, those paddocks that my boys were walking across in that previous image, that's what it looks like out there today. Um, some associated revegetation work along the edge there that Steve Clark drove um, with the tea tree you can see with the help of local friends groups. That is now home to our nationally endangered swamp antichinus or threatened, might be vulnerable, I forget the listing. Um, species that I started out with actually all those years ago when I first began working in the sector uh, and was doing small mammal research. Now this is to my knowledge is the first time that we've detected the species re-inhabiting an area of restored habitat um, in its range which is which is fantastic and shows what's possible here. So um, I hope I haven't gone over time Kathy but on that happy note uh, I'll uh, hand over to you and I guess well, I haven't been keeping an eye on the chat so if there are questions I'm happy to take Yeah we'll, we'll run through them there's lots of interest and we're pretty glad that uh, Nature Girl Trust and you were on the scene as well Mark there's plenty of wetland tragics in here I mean right. a lot of us worked with Brent and Gurry 20 years ago and are still um, still scarred by the upper southeast in South Australia. Um, yes we won't talk about that today. <laughs> but uh, I think you've beautifully illustrated both the legacies we've inherited, but the possibilities. And and some of those simple things like restitching the soil surface and relying on that seed bank. I mean, you know, this stuff is, you know, the art of the possible. And and we love the way you've approached the sites from a very grounded historical point of view, drawing in that history and the, the landholders' obs. Um, but there's a question from Alison in the screen, and you did mention with Glenelg that you've been working with the Gunijmara people. Yeah. How how have you been working with traditional owners across the different um, sites that you've been working on? Yeah, it's a great question, and uh, I'll just come back to you on the the main screen again now. Sorry, just bear with me while I then I won't be distracted. There we go. Uh, yeah. So look, it, it's a case by case thing. If I can be completely honest it depends the as people would be aware working across uh, particularly temperate parts of Australia the the disruption to Aboriginal communities is such that the the, the readiness and the um, capacity of the different groups is highly variable so what we've we've tried to approach the work in such a way that we make it clear that we are um, we are open to being a partner with traditional owners wherever and, and whenever possible. Um, we're, we're also conscious of needing to fix stuff and get on with the job. So we're doing that and all the while where those opportunities exist to involve traditional owners, we're absolutely doing that. In some cases where we're just making it known what we're doing um, and making sure the invitation is always open so that when the, mm. the, the willingness, the readiness, the appetite is there to come and be part of some of these sites, if if traditional owners want to, that that the door's always open. So that's been our approach. Um, we're fortunate with the Long Swamp example that the uh, Gundishmirian Traditional Owners uh, Corporation, the Gundishmara people generally, are, are, are one of the more advanced groups in terms of where they're at with self-organising and, and being in a position to work with. They were crucial for input, advice, communication, particularly with the permanent works phase when we needed to work out right. If we're going to, this is everyone's agreed this is a good idea, how are we going to get the equipment down there on the beach uh, the, the most sensitive way possible respecting cultural heritage? And that was a crucial conversation to make sure that the work was done in the right way. And interestingly, um, you know, even though we did have to call it, cause a minor amount of disturbance that's been temporary and it's just about all evidence of that is gone now, um, you know, we, we were able to negotiate that in such a way that, yeah, you know, the, the work itself happened and it still happened in a timely fashion. Um, we made sure that we stayed clear basically of the most significant areas of the dunes where the middens are in that area that are of high significance. That that whole coastline is effectively a continuous occupation mm. site. Mm. When you look at the amount of mm. material there. So we took the shortest cut, the shortest path we could to the beach and then walked the equipment down the beach basically was the resolution there. And uh, yeah, and the net effect now is a, an environment that will look much more like, uh, you know, and function like it did to be true to the traditional cultural landscape, which is really what a lot of our biodiversity restoration work is about. 
So um, Michael's just asked in relation to the landholder on the western edge of Piccaninny Ponds, how did you navigate the discussions and negotiate the trade-off that, you know, ended in that sort of outcome? Yeah, look, the the philosophy was, well, this is, uh, you know, the sort of outcome that we're going to be seeking to achieve on that site, which is, I must be clear, it's part of Piccaninny Ponds Conservation Park now, and I'm not speaking on behalf of the South Australian Government, it's their, you know, it's their reserve. Um, but at the time, the discussion went something like, you know, if you'd like to be part of this, is there some way that we could work with you to that? Um, after a fair bit of toing and froing, the decision was no. Um, and and because that area is still being managed for production, the objective was how can we go about this in such a way that it that we we don't overinvest in infrastructure, but that it's done in such a way that we can uh, we can protect the interests of the neighbour because. This is a theme for what we do with wetland restoration with NGT. You cannot go about this work and uh, and run the risk of flooding people out or or affecting their livelihoods or, mm. or whatever. Like we, it, this is why the technical side of it, even though the the solutions often look quite low tech, you know, and oh, it's simple, just go and put a few sandbags in. There's actually a lot of planning and thinking has to go into this first. So. Um, I'm keen to reiterate that uh, in the case of that site, there was also a commitment by the government at the time to install observation bores on that side of the fence and to actually, you know, the great news is we've been able to prove that yes, you can maintain an effective drainage service on the farming side by putting the levee bank on the on the conservation side and holding water at an elevation and that drain is actually protecting the neighbouring area. It's been able to be continued to manage as it was uh, and has continued to ever since as farmland. and. And thankfully, because of the constant spring inputs, even though there's seepage through that bank, um, without having any detrimental impacts on the ability to achieve the conservation objectives for Pick Swamp. So it's it's a win-win. But yes, of course, if circumstances change in the future, um, then the possibility to expand the project in that direction is always, a, you know, it, it's always the possibility down the track one day too, potentially. But it, it hasn't, the good news is it hasn't held up achieving the objectives we could achieve today mm. for the site. Um, Gail's also asked about how you go together, you know, piecing together the historical information, you know, the sources and oh golly, and the process yeah. you use. I mean, That's that might that might be something we can um, write up in a story for Wetlands Australia. <laughs> we could, yeah. It's that's probably a whole uh, workshop on its own. It's something that I'm doing my best to also. Uh, yeah, I guess train up a few more people within NGT to feel confident about tackling that because it's a really interesting job that takes a science trained person like myself and no doubt a lot of others who, who are listening or watching uh, into a, a realm that's not, not of our training. Um, but I can't emphasise just how important it is. If you want to understand the genuine long-term history of a site, unfortunately, the, the, the public, the, you know, the, the academic papers don't cover it. They don't, they don't go deep enough, they don't go far enough back. And it does mean that you have to start using a few different skills that don't necessarily come naturally to people of a science training because it's a, it's a, the social science and historic research is a very different field. Um, if people are interested and would like to see how that came about for, for Long Swamp, then they're welcome to email me and I can send you a copy of a paper that was in Ecological Management Restoration, which actually talks about how how we went about blending all these sources of information and how it helped flesh out the history of that site in such a way that gave us confidence to go ahead with the permanent restoration works down there. Um, because the history is always contested and there'll be different points of view and and it's very difficult to get to a final unequivocal version of truth, you know, which is really topical in today's age. But the aim from my point of view is grab as many different sources as we can, the maps, the journals, the historic references, the whatever, and tr it's about triangulating to improve our mm. confidence levels so that you can get as close as you think you possibly can to make a, to make a good call. Yeah. Um, there's a lo there are lots of thanks for the work that you've presented, Mark, um, but I might just wrap up with Tim's question because just recognising that a couple of those projects were funded by the regional um, Land yeah, Partnerships Program. Yep. Um, some Tim Tim Allen, sorry. Um, 
Has there been any state-by-state -state analysis of potential wetland restoration areas based on, you know, picking up the work that you're doing and the opportunities to, to roll further sites out? It's a good question. I, I'm not aware of it at the state level or at a state-by-state -state level. I assume that there are practitioners out there in regions who have these projects at the back of their mind and would be aware of these sites. Um, so yeah, it's a great question. Thanks, Tim, and good day, Tim. Uh, we have done a, uh, for an example, our organisation did an analysis a few years ago for the the southeast was the southeast NRM region at the time. Now the the lands the, the limestone coast landscape board region in the southeast of South Australia, uh, where a form of that has occurred. And I would love to see that sort of analysis done across other regions of particularly. Uh, temperate parts of Australia, the coastal fringe, because there is there is huge potential for going down this path. And particularly, if we think ahead with discussions that are going at the moment with carbon, you know, people use terms blue and teal carbon and what have you, um, you know, the potential investment in biodiversity recovery, which we know needs to be part of the carbon story if we're genuinely serious about protecting this planet, then where does that investment go? And, and and where do the, the, the sort of project and ideas come from to make sure that we're doing the right things in the right places? So, I, I mean, I actually think there's there's a call for some more of that work to be done so that we could have a coherent vision, whether it's at the national level, but certainly at a state by state or region by region level. There are opportunities like mm. this. I mean, subject for another day, but I could give you another yeah. an hour talk with places that I'm aware of in the places I'm familiar with where they're just sitting there and waiting to go if the right chain of events or right tools were available for us to incentivise those outcomes. Yeah. Well, we will be having another conversation with you because we're actually trying to do some expert facilitation around that with our state and territory colleagues and, and other okay. people working in the space because we don't want to be in the scenario where all of these proposals are coming in and we don't have a strategic view of where this investment should go, whether it's under yeah. the ERF or with the, the big projects that the Commonwealth's about to fund in that coastal restoration space. Um, that that also provides a potential future source of income for your work as well with the with the new ERF um, yeah. method. So yeah, well, yeah. That, the, the sooner the better, really, because we've been certainly missing opportunities, and it's sort of you know it is frustrating when you can see we've got these carbon rich mm. environments and they just it, it's just a technical issue. We haven't had the method in place, so yeah, yeah. it's common. Yes, but you know. It sounds like some good things are in the pipeline, which is great to hear. So, yeah. Well, Mark, thank you so much again. Um, there'll be plenty more people that'll be really interested in hearing about this work, and we've spoken about the NGO network. So thanks again. And do Lindell's just put in the chat too that a number of your stories were in Wetlands Australia around some of these sites. They have been over um, years, yeah. Yeah, but to see them visually presented in the way you did, I think, was, you know, fabulous. So well, thanks, Mark, and we will be in touch. Thank you, and thank you very much again for the invitation to be involved today. And and hi to everybody out there. There's some names I rec you know I, yep. I recognise, and uh, hope to catch up with you all sometime soon. Bye bye. See ya. Bye bye.